First and the last stanzas. First and last. Please, may we be standing. This afternoon, the person who is going to speak to us through the grace of God is not a person the Father in God, the Bishop of Guambe Diocese, the Archbishop of just ecclesiastical province, and by the grace of God, the incoming primate, the primate elect, the most reverend Henry Ondokoba, Please, can we welcome him? Praise the Lord. Please sit down. Please sit down. Sit down. Please. Please. Amen. Psalm 90. Psalm number 90. Lord, you have been our dwelling place in all generations. Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Let us pray. Father, we give you thanks from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And you will remain the same forever. We bow before you, the ancient of days. For indeed, who do we have in heaven? It is only you. And God, to whom shall we run on earth? It is only you. You are all that we have. And so, O oh God, our helper, rend the heavens. Intervene in our situations. Turn things.
things around. For Lord, with you, all things are possible. Come and have your place. We ask it in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Your Grace, the Most Reverend Nicholas Oko, the primate of all Nigeria. Baba, we are indeed very grateful to God for your life and for the godly leadership that you have given this church. You have taken us to a very great height. Spiritually, and in fact, pastorally, you have impacted us. Those of us serving in hard places, in challenging conditions, will always remember you for St. Matthias collection and the help we receive. For some, it may look so small, but for us, it is a yoke breaker. We are indeed very grateful. The pastoral heart you have brought into the ministry of this church, and in fact, pushing us bishops to make sure that the laborer receives his wage is something God will always honor you for. You have stood for the Lord, and the Lord will stand for you and your generations in the name of Jesus Christ. Mama, we are very grateful for being there for Baba. And indeed, the women ministry of the Church of Nigeria took a very great leap. And all of us felt it in all our dioceses. We are indeed very grateful. And when I was given this topic, I didn't know that I will be standing to speak here on the capacity of stepping into a big shoe. But, amen, but to God be the glory. We want to thank all our bishops and bishops, all our diocesan mamas, and all our fathers in God. We appreciate all of you and we thank Baba Divkon, Baba Adele, my brother. God bless you, Baba. We are very grateful for the humorous way, the way you take things, make everybody to relax. God bless you, sir. God bless you. Amen. We thank all of you, especially this has been my first time of standing before you. I want to appreciate every one of you for your prayers, for your support, for encouragement, not only unto me, but our fathers in the leadership of the church. May the Lord bless all of us, individually and collectively, in the name of Jesus. We have come here with a great expectation to meet with our God, the one who rules and reigns in Zion and who rules over all. As we gather in this DIFCON 2019, may he dwell among us and give us help in the name of Jesus Christ. The theme of this conference and also the topic of this paper is, Oh God, our help in ages past. Our topic is an adoption of him by Isaac Watts, which was inspired by our text, Psalm 90. 
help is to give assistance to someone in need. And the advanced, Oxford Advanced Learner's Dictionary describes help as to give it, to make it easy and possible for someone to do something by doing something for them or by giving them something that they need. It is to improve a situation or make it easy for something to happen. Here we are talking about God's intervention in our desperate situations when we are without strength in order to bring us out to help us, to deliver us, to save, to heal, and to give us victory and hope. God did it in the past, and he is doing it in the present, and he shall do it even into the future. He is our God. He, God is all we have. He is our present help in times of trouble. He is our safety and our security in times of uncertainties. When we look at Nigeria and the things that surround us, we can read from everything around us that Nigeria is fast becoming a failed state. We are banditry, kidnapping, violent crimes, poverty, spiritual wickedness, and moral bankruptcy abound. Most people, even among us here, are carrying about afflictions, hurts, and pains in their hearts and in their lives. And sometimes we are overwhelmed. Our theme is apt as it draws our attention to remember the past mercies of God who had intervened to heal, deliver, and supply our needs when we were in, des when we were in desperate condition. In the midst of our struggles and battles of life, we shall remember the faithfulness of our God and what he has done. And as the psalmist says, this is my inf infirmity, but I will remember the years of the right hand of the Most High. Again, the psalmist says, when I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches because you have been my help. Therefore, in the shadow of your wings, I will rejoice. My soul follows close behind you. Your right hand opposed me. Psalm 63, 6 to 8. This is also a time to call upon the Lord in faith and to express our longing for him continually to request of him to intervene in our lives and situations. We have come to seek God as our only help and we hope and long for him as one who is thirsty in a dry land where there is no water. Brethren, these are desperate times. God will surely arise on our behalf. We come in faith in the living God through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and in the power of the Holy Spirit to obtain favor to help us in time of need. Psalm 90 is attributed to Moses. The opening verses of Psalm 90 introduce us to God who is eternal, infinite, and awesome in contrast to our human frailty. God is our dwelling place and security. Life challenges are real and can be overwhelming. Hence, our constant need 
for God's help. Moses experienced God and he also saw raw slavery and the suffering of Israelites. But he chose to identify with God's people in their suffering. As the writer of Hebrews says, by faith, Moses refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin. As strangers on earth, we need help. But from whom shall we seek help? Many seek help from fellow men. But the scripture tells us that the help of man is vanity. As the psalmist says, put not your trust in princes, nor in the son of man in whom there is no help. His breath goes forth. He returns to the earth. In that very day, his thoughts perish. Psalm 146, 3 and 4. Some put their trust in the strength of wealth, abilities, achievements of the flesh. Some seek help like Israel of old from the Baal and Asherah that surround them. From demons, mediums, and spirits. Some depend on themselves and resort to self-help. This too is vanity. In desperate search for help, some people go to have the, uh, the demonic alliance and covenants. To such, God is saying, woe to them that go to Egypt for help. Brethren, Jeremiah makes it clear in Jeremiah 17, 5 to 8, that it is a cause for any man to trust a man. But it is a blessing and help when we trust in the Lord. God is our very present help in time of trouble. And in every situation, when we lift up our eyes, even unto the hills, our help can only come from the Lord, our God. The help we are talking about has to do with compassion and empathy. Every help of God flows from his compassion and mercy. Every help of God adds value to our lives and fulfills God's eternal purpose in the lives of the persons he helps. Jesus was moved by the spiritual lusts, lostness of the crowd. As we see in Matthew chapter 9, verses 37 and 38, he was also moved by the hunger and pain of the people when he fed the multitude. And Jesus was also moved by the sorrow of that widow of Nain, whose only son died. When Jesus saw the situations of these people, he was moved to help them. God is our dwelling place, not just our security in this world, but more so, like the Israelites, led by Moses, we are pilgrims on a journey. And compared with eternity, this world has nothing to offer us. Even in the face of suffering, in fact, as Paul says in Romans 8, 18, I consider that the sufferings of this present shall not be compared with the glory that shall be revealed in us. Brethren, our real home is heaven, where Jesus Christ has gone to prepare and earnestly he desires that where he is in glory, there shall his servants be also. 
And so we shall look at the God of our help. We shall look at the instances of God's help. And we shall look at the conditions necessary for us to experience the help of God. And we will now look at, the, at God's own expectation of those he is helping. And we look at the implications and conclusion, if time permits. The God of our help, it is necessary for us to understand that where we seek help and where we get help matters. It is clear that all of us are in need of help. No matter how big we are, no matter how small we are, no matter how rich we are or how poor we are, every man, every woman, every boy, every girl needs help, assistance to move him forward and to help him achieve what God has intended for him. But the help we are talking about is the help that comes from God. The help that God himself is the source and the giver. And when we look at the God of our help, we can see that this God is the sovereign Lord. We can see that this God is the eternal God. We can see that this God is the God of mercy. We can see that he is the God of compassion. We can see that he is the God of all generations. As we consider that text of Psalm 91 and 2. As the sovereign Lord, he is God over all and has plan and purpose for every situation. God has the power to work out his own purpose in our lives, no matter the condition, whether it is good or bad. In fact, because he is the sovereign Lord, he can walk through any condition. Praise the Lord. God did what he did for Israel while they were in bondage in Egypt. Because of his covenant promises he made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, when Moses demanded to know the name or the identity of God, the answer was, and God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial to all generations. It is clear that the God with whom we are dealing is the I am who I am. This is his name, and this is his memorial to all generations. God is the God of the now. He is also the God of the past and he will be the God that will be ever present. He is known and shall be known by what he does. His mighty deliverance and redemption for his people. He sees our oppressions. He hears our cry and he knows our sorrows and our afflictions. But more so, God is saying, so I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and bring them to a good and large land. God is not only awesome, but he, he hears us, he understands us, but more so, he comes to our situation to help us. Brethren, even when it seems that the situation works against us, God can allow adversity, persecutions, sufferings, sickness, and even death to come to us, but not to destroy us, but often to bring out the best, to bring out the gold in us. Even when he allows adversities and challenges to come our way, 
It may be to test our faith. It may be to correct us. It may be to discipline us. But in it all, he is working out his eternal purpose. As we may see even in the life of Joseph, who was sold into slavery in Egypt, Joseph said to his brothers, do not be afraid, for am I in the place of God? But as you, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring it about as it is this day to save many people alive. Amen. Brethren, <laughs> even if the Lord allows the enemy to, 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 to plan evil or wickedness against you, your family, against the church, as the sovereign Lord, I am trusting the God of our help that he is able to turn it for our good in the name of Jesus. Romans 8, 28 says, And we know that all things work for the good of those who love God and those who are called according to his purpose. And I know that God, God's purpose in your life, in your family, and in my life, in the nation, in the church of God, shall surely come to pass in the name of Jesus Christ. The sovereign Lord has power to change our situations. And therefore, we need to depend upon him. He is the God who rules and reigns forever and ever. He is our help. He is the eternal God. He is the God of mercy. Amen. The awesomeness, as the God of mercy, the awesomeness of God is most felt when we experience God in our helplessness. Let me talk from the situation in which the Lord has sent us to minister in the Northeast. It could be possible that a village, a town, a city can be attacked. In the morning, you may have peace. Turn your business and do your work. But by night, a village can be raised to the ground and many killed. When such happens, and it happens that you and your family escape with your lives, and your family is safe. But when you return, you find out that the village or the city has been vandalized and burnt down completely. The experience can be very devastating. Yet, in the midst of those ashes and smoke, you remember that some were not as lucky as you are. Hear God as he speaks through his servant, Jeremiah. In the midst of the devastations of the fall of Jerusalem, the, the destruction of the temple, and the devastations that surrounded them. And he says, in the book of Lamentation, 22 to 24, though the lost mercy, through the lost mercy, we are not consumed, because his compassion fell not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I hope in him. Brethren, even when we look at our salvation, we can see that even when we had no God, no hope, no inheritance, no portion in the promises of God, yet the Bible goes on to say we, we are slaves. If not Jesus, some of us will be carrying the bags of witches, witch doctors and, uh, and, uh, and even be slaves. Some of us will become nothing. But thank God for Jesus, our God who is rich in mercy, the God of mercy, our help, that when our Lord would have been destruction and condemnation, yet he showed us mercy. It is for his mercy that we are not consumed. 
Amen. Thank God. By his mercy, he saved us through our Savior, Jesus Christ. Faith, not because of anything that we have done, but because of his favor, mercy. Mercy triumphs even over condemnation and judgment. And one of the powerful things that God exercised over us is mercy. And it seems the government of the world have also understood what it means. One of the constitutional provisions or rights of a governor or a president or a chief judge is the prerogative of mercy. I served in the prerogative of mercy committee in Gombe State. We would go to a prison, look at people, take their, check their records, make recommendations, and present to the governor. And then on Independence Day or Democracy Day, on, he will now announce, Mr. Soso and So is now pardon, Malan Wane, Anyaveshi, Asakeshi. And what does that mean? From that moment of his pronouncement, his crime record is cancelled. His offense wiped away. He will walk out of the prison free. Brethren, Jesus has done something more than this. Amen. That is what the Lord has done for us. That we can walk out free. And he said, there is now no condemnation. Oh Lord, we give you glory, our help. No more condemnation for them that are in Christ Jesus. No more condemnation. He has wiped away, cleansed, canceled God, our help. Do we talk of the compassion of God? Do we talk of his compassion? Looking at that woman crying, a widow. The husband died. And the only thing that keeps her alive, the only son, the enemy came But thank God that that day Jesus was going to name. And as they were carrying the corpse of this young man in the open coffin, you know, no matter the sympathy of anybody around you, you know that there is a limit to any man can, what any man can do for you. What they can only do is, hey, yeah, sorry. But when you meet Jesus, when you meet Jesus, our helper, he turns things around. He says, stop, stop. Woman, cry no more. I am hearing the Lord saying to somebody, cry no more. Cry no more. And those that were carrying the, the, the coffin stood still. And I know that when they stood, heaven also stood for you. Amen. Amen. There was something happening. Jesus was moved. Jesus was moved. And I want to assure you that your situation, whatever you have brought into this conference, touches the heart of God. Touches the heart of God. May he meet you. May he meet you at the point of need. That which no man can do for you. Oh, may God do it unto you. In the name of Jesus. And when he came there, he just touched the, he said, young man, arise. Arise. The voice of the Lord may be going forth right now, telling somebody who may have resigned. And you, you know, some people, when you tell them, they say, he that is down fears no fall. That's the way, way there for grand, waiting the fear again. They don't fall, finish. But I want to tell you, the Lord is saying, Arise. Get up from where you are. It is not yet over. Who is it that will speak and it will come to pass? When the Lord has not spoken, God is, has a word for us. 
He has a word for me. He has a word for you. Brethren, arise. And the Bible says that he that was dead, he that was dead, amen, he that was dead, amen, praise the Lord. Sorry, this is a paper, not a sermon. Amen. Brethren, this God is the God of all generations. Times and tides may change. But the God of our help remains the same in all generations. As the psalmist says, Lord, you have boon our dwelling place in all generations. The God who helped Noah in the days of the flood is the same God who called Abraham from the awe of Chaldeans and made a nation out of him. He is the same that raised a mighty salvation for us in his son Jesus Christ from the seed of David. It is this God that has raised up a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people unto our God in Christ Jesus that we may declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. The generation, my brother, my sister, remember, the generation that came out from Egypt with Moses never entered into the promised land. They all perished in the wilderness. Why? Because of unbelief, because of sin and disobedience. But moreover, their problem was the problem of the heart. They had slave mentality. You can imagine people who are set free from bondage and they will be thinking of onions and cucumber and lettuce that they were eating in Egypt. And garlic. Tell me what can you, if not the smell of garlic, what do you gain from it? But you know, when we lose our bearing, when we lose focus, even the things that do not even matter anything become something substantial. Listen to some of the quarrels we have in our PCCs. Press it hard. You will find out that there is nothing inside it. Garlic. Cucumber. Brethren, because of slave mentality, God knew. In fact, within 40 days, Israel was already on the verge of entering into the promised land. After all, they went to bury Jacob and came back. No be so. Forty days, they were already at the verge of entering into the promised land. But because of slave mentality, brethren, you can never go to battle with a bunch of slaves and win. No, no slave is qualified to win any battle. Are you hearing me? If you are a slave of sin, you have no business for victorious Christian living. If you are a slave, you cannot win. But this afternoon, we are raising the banner of the help of God. Amen. You can receive help. You can receive help. Our present help is here. Jesus is his name. Amen. And God had to keep them for 40. In fact, it's like every 40 days. The 40 days turned into 40 years. So that they would die. But one wonderful thing, including Moses himself, passed with that generation. But only two people survived. Caleb and Joshua. Brethren, God is raising the Joshua generation. God is raising the Joshua generation. My brother, you are one of them. My sister, you are one of them. 
The Joshua generation is the conquering generation. The Joshua generation is the covenant generation. The Joshua generation is the circumcised generation. The Joshua generation is the covenant generation. The Joshua generation believed God and followed God with all their heart. And that was what happened. God said to Caleb, because you have followed me and obeyed me, everywhere you have stepped upon, I will give it unto you and your descendants. And you remember when he went to Joshua, he said, Josh, Joshua, you remember what God said that day through the mouth of the servant of God, the man of God, Moses, concerning me, as if it is only him. <laughs> you know? Anyway, he would say, Joshua, you don't get your portion. Give me my own portion. Give me my mountain. Even though the giants are still there. I am 85 years now, but my strength was as, as it was when I was 40 years. The Lord shall renew your strength. He will give you your mountain. He will give you your mountain. Because he is the God of our generation. Amen. Praise the Lord. Brethren, there are instances of God's help. There are instances of God's help. And we can see that God helps individuals, families, and nations. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, verses 1 to 12, we see there Samuel and Israel were helped by God. God's demand was that Israel should turn away from Baal and put away their strange gods and return with all their hearts to the living God. And when they did that, God fought for Israel and broke the yoke of bondage of 20 years to the Philistines. I don't know how long you have been struggling with that problem, but I want to tell you that as God helped Israel, he will help you. No matter how long. Amen. There is nothing so big or too difficult for our God. God so fought for Israel that this weak Israel drove the Philistines back as far back as Betka. And they realized that this is not ordinary. It was the help of God. And Samuel raised a stone between Mizpah and Shein and called his name Ebenezer. For thus far, for thus far, because the Lord has helped you thus far, he will carry you far into the future. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Amen. When we look at 2 Chronicles chapter 14, from verse 9 to 15, and also in chapter 15, we see God's extraordinary intervention and help to King Asa of Judah and the entire nation of Judah. When King Sarah of Ethiopia came against Judah, King Sarah attacked Judah with one million strong army and 300 chariots in the battle of Maresha. Judah had only 580 soldiers who were barely having bows and arrows. But when King Asa saw what was coming, he cried out to God. And Asa cried out to the Lord, his God, and said, Lord, it is nothing for you to help. Whether with many... <laughs> whether with many or with those who have no power. Amen. Help us, O Lord, our God, for we rest on you, and in your name we go against this multitude. O Lord, you are our God. Do not let man prevail against you. Amen. What, an, what a pouring out of a, a man's heart. 
How can 580 soldiers with barely bow and arrow face a mighty army of 1 million with another 300 chariots prepared for war? But he realized that God can save even those who have no power. I know you don't have any power. You have little strength in you. God will help you. God will help me. God will help us. And you know the Lord says, I am the Lord, I change not. And therefore you sons, you seed of Jacob, you are not consumed. That situation will not consume you. We have come to the, the mount of our help. This is our Mount Zion. And the Lord says that upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance and holiness and the tribe of Jacob shall possess their possessions. Don't go out from this mount until you have received their portion. Amen. Amen. We have come to the mount of our help. Amen. Praise the Lord. Brethren, when we look at what God did, God answered Asa and honored his name. We can see God fight our battles and he will surely do it in the name of Jesus. It is very spectacular when we look at Acts of the Apostles chapter 12. Acts of the Apostles chapter 12. That whole chapter always gives me encouragement. The Bible says that Herod vexed and persecuted the church. Those of us in the Northeast will tell, will tell you how, how wonderful it can be. Amen. He killed, he beheaded James, and when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he went further and took Peter and put him in prison. And it was noted that it was during the Passover. For you to attack the servant of God at the time when we are celebrating when Jesus disarmed the principalities and powers and made a public show of, of them and triumphed over them in, on the cross, brethren, know that the enemy has made a fundamental mistake. He has attacked at the wrong time and the wrong person. <laughs> Amen. You should not be the target. Praise the Lord. But because the enemy has done what he has done, the Lord who delivered Peter, the Bible says in verse 5, that the church continually were praying in prayer, interceding. And what happened? And now behold, an angel of the Lord stood by Peter and a, a light shone in a light shone in the prison and he struck Peter on the side and raised him up saying arise quickly and his chains fell off his hands then the angel said to him guard yourself and tie on your sandals and so he did and he said to him, put on your garment and follow me. I believe that in this gathering, before we rise up from this place, God will strike somebody to say, rise up. From every sleep of death, from every sleep of sin, from every sleep of complacency, from every sleep of I don't care. The law, if, you know, there are so many Christians Christians who are careless with the things that the Lord has done for us. Arise! You can imagine, the church was praying. What was Peter doing? <sighs> but I can see that Peter said, this one may be my palavo, not my trouble. It is God's own problem. It didn't prevent him from sleeping. You know, to his beloved, he giveth sleep. 
The enemy may attack to destroy, but God will give you sleep. You will rest. Because even in the presence of your enemies, he will prepare a table. There will be celebration. Amen. We are prepared for celebration of the victory, the help of our God. So shall it be in the name of Jesus. And he said, rise up. Rise up, Peter. But not only that, the chains broke of their own accords. Every chain, every chain holding you on the leg, on the hand, or whatever, by the reason of the anointing, let there be the breaking of every yoke in the name of Jesus Christ. And he says, guard yourself, guard your loins, tie your sandals, put on the whole armor of God, rise up. And the Bible says, Peter did so. And he said, put on your garment. The Lord will put the garment of righteousness upon us. It is by that that we will overcome in the name of Jesus Christ. And as we obey God and follow him in the path of righteousness, in the path of life, he will take us, he will show us the path that leads to life. Amen. And as we obey him, oh, the God of our help will help us in the name of Jesus Christ. Brethren, my time is running to a close. But let us look at some of the things that God, conditions that God is expecting that we need to observe, take note of, in order to get his help in times of trouble. There are six conditions. One is repentance. Two is faith in the living God. Three is the word of God. Four is humility. Five is prayer. And six is expectation. The expectation of the righteous shall not be cut short, but it shall be granted unto him. In the name of Jesus. Brethren, repentance, I want to say it this way, repentance, number one, is painful. You know, when we give altar calls, some people just rush, and you give, if you give it three times within this week, you may see the same person responding those three times. Repentance is very painful because it hits us where our pride we want to cover. Repentance humbles us. When it is a genuine repentance, as Paul said to the Corinthians, he says, I thank God that you had godly repentance. There is also an ungodly one. Godly repentance leads to life. In fact, godly sorrow leads to true repentance, which leads us to life. But when it is just follow, follow, you lose nothing. It is not painful. You know, we used to know when sinners used to cry. We, we used to see people broken down. We used to see people very sorrowful. Our repentance today do, do not cost us anything. But look at the church in Ephesus, as of the Apostles chapter 19. He said, when they repented, what happened? They brought out those who practice magic. What did they do? They brought out their books. You know the huge amount of money that they had invested in the kingdom of darkness. They brought everything out. Today, who brings out? We still want to return what we, we, we have. And you know one thing. So long as you hold the things of the devil, the devil will always come. True repentance breaks from the past. Metanoia is a 
a total turnaround. It's a change of heart. It's a change of attitude. It's a change of way of life. It's a change of the whole thing. And that is why the scripture says, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. The old things are passed away. Behold, the new. Everything has become new. In the place where I'm ministering, there was this time that they wanted to implement Sharia. And uh, some of the argument of our Christian area is that Sharia <laughs> al Adam Mune. Do you want me to interpret that? <laughs> Drunkenness and drinking burukutu is part of our food, it is part of our culture. But when the same man becomes a Muslim, he will stop drinking burukutu. But as Christians, they are pe we pay to them. He said, What is it that is remaining? What have you lost as a result of repentance? What have you given up? Paul says, for the sake of knowing Jesus, I count every other thing as refuge. What have you lost? What we have today is our pride. What we have today is our pomposity. Fake. Oh, God is raising a new generation. And I pray that there will be the generation of Joshua. The generation that will take the land. The generation that will preach the gospel. The generation that will know because of the circumcision and covenant in the Lord Jesus that there is possession of the land. Amen. Brethren, faith in the living God and his word is very, very vital. It's very, very necessary. Brethren, we need the word of God to hold on to, on to the word of God and his promises. As we do that, it releases God's power into our human situations. Both to heal, to restore, to build, to encourage, and to establish. May that be our portion in the name of Jesus. Hear King Jehoshaphat, who stood among his people and said, Hear, O Judah, and you inhabitants of Jerusalem, believe in the Lord your God, and you shall be established. Believe his prophets, believe his word, and you shall prosper. May that be our portion in the name of Jesus Christ. Humility. We cannot receive anything from God except we humble ourselves. For God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And he says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he may exalt you in due time. And I believe that this is the due time. Amen. This is the due time. This is the moment of exaltation that we need to humble ourselves so that God can intervene in our situation. Prayer. Prayer is inevitable for God to intervene in any human situation. God does not impose himself on any man. He, he desires that his children should talk to him on everything and for everything. All that we have mentioned above are summed up in Second Chronicles 7, 13 and 14, where the Lord says, when I shut up the heaven and there is no rain, or command the locusts to devour the land, or pestilence among my people, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn away from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and we forgive their sins and heal their land. Do we need God's intervention? Do we really need God's help? May it be that we will turn to him with all our hearts. Finally, expectation of the servants of God. Sometimes we come to God, we pray, and not even expecting that God will answer. But I want to tell you, God hears even the sigh of our hearts. Expectation is very vital. It's a very vital part of exercising one's faith in God. 
God is the rewarder of those who seek him diligently. And when we shall come unto him in faith, according to Hosea 6, 1 to 3, God will surely show forth. For his going forth is established as the morning. As sure as the rising up of the sun in the morning is, so is the appearance of God. God manifesting himself on your behalf. Amen. The Lord is saying, as sure as the, you are sure that the sun will rise every morning. He said, be sure that I will show up. God will show up upon your, um, on your behalf. Amen. 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 God's expectation. Let me just mention quickly. Number one, God, you know, sometimes when we are helped and God delivers us, you see that we begin to think that it is by our, our power. It is by our wisdom. Our wayo. Our, our system. That's what is giving us success. No, it is God. It is God. Brethren, I want to tell you that Sometimes it is more difficult to manage success than managing failure. Failure humbles me. Failure <laughs> takes away my pride. I remember going for driving test after driving car for so many years. Maybe out of nervousness, I put my hand on the this thing and I was driving. And after that test, the VIO told me, you have failed. I said, me? I have driven for three years. And you say, I failed driving test. But my wife went for driving test only once and passed. Because I failed that driving test, I had to go back to read the book very well, try to learn from my mistakes. And went back the second time. And that second time, even after driving, I was still shivering because I don't know whether I will pass or fail. When you don't have confidence in yourself and you are trust is only in the Lord, my brother, I want to tell you that God is ready to do something. He will show up for you. But when you are so this thing, confident, <laughs> say he resists the proud. And because of that, the Lord is asking us to honor him when he has done so much for us. When we look at Deuteronomy 8, 11 to 20, and even John 15, 1 to 8, even verse 5 says, without me, you can do nothing. And so, when God blesses us, when God helps us, when God gives us victory, when God opens the door, when God lifts us up, when God blesses oh, brethren, number one, the Lord says, honor me. Honor the Lord. Honor God. We must honor God who has helped us in the days of our distress. Number two, glorify God. Sometimes God reveals our true condition and how far he has helped us so that we can glorify him alone. Number three, when God helps us, he wants us to grow in faith. It is an assurance that when we seek God, we will find him. And when God helps us, our faith is strengthened. We should testify of God's goodness in order to encourage and strengthen the faith of our brethren. Testimony of faith stirs up and it is also an instrument of victory. Amen. Fourthly, when God helps us so that we are not puffed off, the Lord wants us to stand firm in the Lord Jesus Christ and be totally committed to him. Be totally committed to him. Dan Juma Goje, when he was the governor of Gombe, said something that struck me. 
He said, in politics, there is nothing as 95 or 98% loyalty. It is either 100% or nothing. Our commitment to the Lord, brethren, it is costly. The Lord is demanding it. Our obedience to the Lord should not compete with any other thing. Brethren, the Lord is helping us so that we can stand firm and committed in him and to him. It is not enough to be victorious. But what matters is are we standing after victory? Ephesians 6, 10 to, 8, 10 to 18 tells it all. Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wires of the devil. We need to stand. Some of us, because of what God has done for us, you celebrate and after celebration, that one don't pass. God wants us to move on from stage to stage, from glory to glory. As we behold the face of the Lord by the power of the Holy Spirit, the Lord is wanting us to grow. My brother, my sister, desire to go to the higher level. That the Lord will lift us and cause our feet to stand upon the rock and make us to walk upon our high places. Brethren, let us move on. As the writer of Hebrews says, let us move on to more mature things. Amen. Praise the Lord. The implications, let me just mention them quickly because uh, Baba Difcon is behind me. Brethren, what is the implication of this in walking with God? Number one, this is the time of God's help. Amen. This is the hour of God's help. This is the moment of God's help. And that is why he has given us his Holy Spirit. That is why he has come to be with us. That is why he has brought us to this place. Amen. Now is the time. Amen. He says, in an acceptable time I have had you. And in the day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. May God help us to take hold of what he is offering us in the name of Jesus. Two, the implication is that we have total victory through our faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. And this is faith. Faith. Victory through faith in Jesus Christ. For that is the victory that overcomes the world. Faith in the word of God. That is the weapon of God against sin. Faith in the word of God that we proclaim. That is the, the word. The power. Unto salvation for all who believe. Our faith in Christ Jesus is the victory that overcomes the world. And so, brethren, let us hold on to it. Finally, we need to focus on our eternal destination. God is our dwelling place. Therefore, ultimately, heaven is our eternal home. Heaven is our eternal destination. This is our real rest, our dwelling place. Jesus Christ asks, what shall it profit a man? If he will gain the whole world and lose his soul, the salvation of our soul and our eternal rest with God in heaven is worth more than any other thing in the world. Sometimes it is even better for us to have the thorn in our flesh and remain in the grace of God and make heaven. It is better. Sometimes it is even better for us to lose our eye or have our hand or our leg cut off and suffer for the faith in Christ Jesus than for us to have our whole body cut
cast into the lake of fire. Brethren, the saints of old so walked with God that God was not ashamed of them. Why? Because they trusted him both in good times and in challenging times. He has never changed. The desire of Jesus is that he will come to take us and we shall be with him. Jesus Christ is coming back again very soon. We need to prepare to meet with the Lord. He is coming to take the saints to receive them to himself in rapture that they may dwell with him eternally. Are you ready? Am I ready? Are we ready for the coming of the Lord who is our dwelling place? In conclusion, God is still in the business and work of helping his servants who put their trust in him as we see in Acts of the Apostles chapter 12. Our theme evokes memories of God's help in the past, but it also reminds us of the experience of God's help in the present. But more so, it points us to the aspiration of God's purpose in the future. No matter my condition or your condition or what you are passing through or what we are passing through, no matter our struggles and our fears, we should have courage and faith for the Lord God Almighty is our help. Please stand up, let us pray. Let's internalize what we have heard into our lives as a promise. Look at the conclusion. This is amazing. It's very clear and the message is ever true. No matter our situation, no matter our struggles and fears, we should have courage and faith for the Lord Almighty is our help. Just internalize that. Lord be my helper. Lord be my strength. Lord be my witness. Lord be my courage. Take away fear from my life. Increase my faith. Increase my faith. I've heard your word this afternoon, Lord. I want to advance in your presence. We are made a garment of faith, garment of trust. Lift me up beyond this present level. Help me, Lord, to honor you. Help me, O oh God, to honor the conditions you have put in my life. It was, let me be able to seek you fervently. Let me stand firm. Let me be committed to you. Lord, visit me with your courage. Let the ultimate be set before us. There is heaven before us. Prepare us for this heaven. Don't let us miss heaven after pursuing all the shadows of this world, all the ephemeras, unimportant things, fighting and struggling on nothing, absolutely nothing. Help me, Lord, that my name be written in the book of life. Please, Lord, please, Lord. That is bigger than here. That's bigger than the present situation. Encourage me to declare for you, Lord. I've heard your voice this afternoon. Don't let me go back just like that. Let my faith be visited and increased. Thank you so much for your word this afternoon, Lord. We pray that just as we have said to you now, let 
testimonies abide in our spiritual lives because this is basically a spiritual approach and a spiritual angle. Let it bless our lives, bless our engagements, bless our ministries and make us what you want us to be according to your word. Please, Lord, please, Lord, don't let us miss the great thing while pursuing the rats, the air, the ephemeras, the unimportant things. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Can I hear your amen loud and clear? Praise the Lord. Saints have to